Hi there. What's up? I'm Ola, an inhabitant of Lightbulb Moment, aka digital entrepreneur, a proud aunt, and a goofy nerd. I'm Chris, a designer, a creative tech enthusiast, and a semi-grown kid. This is the Ranting Bananas podcast. It sound right, boy. Hi, welcome back to、um, Branding Bananas, episode five of our series Big Questions. It's actually a surprise episode. Originally, we had planned to film four episodes,、um, but a couple of weeks after we had finished filming, there was some news that、uh, that Chris has, had received. So we wanted to f- to film a follow up、um, to fill you guys in on what's been happening. So, Chris, do you want to jump in and let us know? So, if you remember, in episode four, I came to the conclusion of having radio silence. Right, I didn't want to be disrupted with with news, and I just needed some time to think in terms of my involvement. But before radio silence, I had no, I had known or Sarah, and I just want to sorry, I want to point out something. Sarah is an alias, so we want to protect the person involved. So we're using the name Sarah, and it's not actually a person called Sarah. Anyway. So Sarah told me that she had been,、uh, she is expecting in December, right? So then I requested radio silence through our therapy conversation, our group therapy conversation, and it was a time for me to really figure out what my involvement was. At that time, my involvement was I'm happy to have the child know who I am and, and how to find me, and I think that's fair enough. But since there's a few weeks from recording this episode, we had been working on the series previous, all the four episodes that you guys may have may may or may not have seen. I get a text, and it comes from Sarah. So she's broke radio silence, and the text said, "Hey Chris, no more baby. I think you should know." So I was just like, "Holy shit!" What happened? So we get into conversation, and、um, I'm like, like you know, what happened? Are you okay? And all this stuff. And turns out that she had a miscarriage, and、um, it's kind of rare because she was moving into her second trimester. We had already passed the twelve week phase.、Uh, so second trimester, for those who don't know, is a thirteen to twenty week. Phase and actually the risk of having a miscarriage drops significantly, right? So、um, of of course I was worried about like her health situation because second trimester miscarriages are more rare and it may be an indication of like long term health conditions and certain infections. So I was yeah、um, pretty worried about that. So that's in a nutshell what happened. Yeah. So when you found out, can you tell me how you felt? Sure.、Um, there was so many emotions. Like, it was. It. I mean, of course, that the first immediate thought was I felt super bad for Sarah because if anything, she was being the strong one for for both of us, and I basically freaked out、um, as you do. So, and I believe that because she's pregnant, she, you know. Was forced to keep it right based on her beliefs,、uh, and and she believed that she could do it. You know, be a single mum, or at least take on the 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 forced situation of being a single mum if if it happened. And I know that she, you know, developed a, a real connection with the thing growing inside her because what person wouldn't? And from the way she was talking about it, when we didn't have radio silence, I, I knew that that was a thing. Um, also, that she had given up on, on her good job for the health of the baby is what she told me. So that was like one part of it where I was like, "Oh my god,、um, what happened to Sarah?" And you know, like, is is she doing okay? Basically. But then, to be honest, on the other side, I was relieved. Uh, even though it's a terrible thing that happened, and、uh, you know emotionally and physically for both of us, I think,、um, from my perspective anyway, I think it's the best sort of 
long-term thing that probably could have happened. I think it saved a lot of, I don't know, conflicts and uh, decision-making and mm. and all the things that come with uh, raising a kid, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to do. So, um, and I kept on thinking, uh, which was funny, that if, like, the decision that, you know, radio silence and also in December the baby was due and I had this mm. thought in the back of my mind which was like if I'm not a part of this child's life I'll regret it later in life because I just know that's who I am and it's going to basically like keep nagging me in the back of the head and eventually mm. I think I would need like you know I just feel that sense of duty for some reason to to not being able to ignore that and and then act on that right so as I said again, yeah, I felt relieved. Like overall, um, it happened, and it is what it is. And I, I think we just need to move forward from from this. So, me, me and Sarah had a really, actually, a really nice conversation, and you know, our, you know, talking for a bit, just trying to console her and and just try trying to you know uh, generally care about what she's going through, and and it seems like physically she has got over the hump of recovering and she let me knew she let me know like a few weeks after uh, um but it seems like she's a lot happier doing what she wants she's going back to school and studying fashion design and so her, her life is definitely you know turned to to a pos positive way and it, it seems like she, she's finally happy with what she's doing and and I'm I'm super happy for her, but sure, I mean it's like lots of emotions like left, right, and center. Sorry, I have to charge my laptop and <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Just, just like, open, <laughs> open my heart <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, oh wait, hold on. I need to I'm just gonna charge my laptop here. Um, yeah, w w when you told me about this, uh, when she sent you that text, I think I immediately felt a sense of guilt. And I think it was, I mean, I'm guessing that's the same thing you were going through, right? Because it was such a kind of like a bittersweet situation, right? Because we had been talking so much about how you didn't want the baby and how, you know, some of our beliefs are the baby would have been much happier in a in an actual family, right? Where there's there's like both parents, they love each other and they raise the kid. Um, they raise the child as uh, as they would really want to, right? Giving them everything that they think the child deserves. Um, so so you and I had been exploring so many avenues of like, oh, what if this happened? Or like, what if that, you know, like, what if you chat to Sarah and then she decides not to have the baby and et cetera, et cetera. So I think there was so much of that um, in our heads that when this actually happened, which, you know, statistically it's one in four pregnancies, right? So it's not that uncommon to happen. But like you said, after the 12 weeks, that percentage dropped significantly. So it's not something we were expecting. I think it felt a bit like for a moment there, I was like, did we wish this into happening? And I know it's like very foolish to think, but that like that's what guilt is, right? Thinking that you're responsible for whatever happens in the world. But I, I was also, I think in a way though, and, and I'd love to ask Sarah about this, um, and just, you know, I don't think I mentioned this on the podcast, but I had written an email to Sarah when we started this and um, and I had asked her, I, I had said to her, you know, we're going to be recording this podcast. Obviously, we're going to be discussing this. Is she OK with that? And would she like to participate? Because I thought it would be a bit unfair if we only kind of listened to your side of the story, but didn't really actually hear her side of the story. So I said anytime she wants to join us or do a separate one where you are not there, obviously, then she can. So yeah I, I would love to hear um even you know on the podcast or just privately from Sarah to hear how she feels about it because I wonder if there's a sense of relief for her too or does she just feel really sad about it um because I remember when I decided to t do the abortion there was also guilt that I felt about you know just getting rid of the the fetus but I also felt 
there was moments when I was wondering, I was like, what if this baby had lived? And what if I could have had this baby? Like, what would my life look like? And would it have been the most amazing thing or most beautiful thing I had ever gone through because this child would be alive, right? What would it, what would our lives look like? But now, obviously, like, even after a couple of weeks, I felt a huge sense of relief and just feeling like I knew I did the right thing because I didn't want a baby, right? I wanted a family. So I wonder if if Sarah felt that as well. And I don't know if you guys spoke about it. Um, we did not speak about it. Um, I think it was... I, I didn't want to get too deep, it, it, like, so quickly. Um, I don't, like, I think my and her relationship, just because how it ended, I don't think it's ever going to be, like, mended or repaired because, like, I freaked out and she mm. was like, you're a dick. Or, like, she wasn't actually like, you're a dick. She was just like, this is what I'm going to do. So I, I don't know if it would ever be, like, what it was when we first met or all that time we spent together. So... Because she's going through this transition, so I'm just going to speak on my outsider's perspective, right? Which is like, because she's transitioning mm -hmm. her career and having a baby would basically, you know, put a huge delay or even potentially stop that from happening and put more stress financially on her family. As I said, she was the main breadwinner. So for this, it gives her some more, I guess, capacity to like try things and, and fail and maybe go back into work or even, you know, if she doesn't fail, like pursue this like full time. And, you know, I think it would be better long term in terms of selfishly, you know, like a an adult decision. Right. That, that's how I always looked at it. Okay, so we're back after some technical glitches. Back to my previous point of ultimately, I think a bad thing that happened is actually going to be good for her for the long term. Um, I actually believe this to be true because I don't think either of us were fully equipped to go through this situation. And I think it, it would have been just hard for both of us and... Um, yeah, like if we could help it, you know, rewinding back time, if we could help it, I don't think we would have done the same things or made the same decisions. So ultimately, this is kind of a bit of an undoing, but, you know, cold hearted as that sounds, like I, yeah, I, I'm generally, you know, relieved and, um, yeah, I think just, I think relief is just, the, the word I'm, I'm looking for. I don't think I have anything better than that, but yeah. I mean, I think I'm a deep believer in everything happens for a reason, right? I, I, I really do believe that. And even when bad stuff happens uh, to me, to people that I love, and at first you can't really see the positive side, I guess my personality is glass half full always, uh, annoyingly to some people probably, but yeah, I, I do I do think positives are gonna come out of this, right? And and hopefully Sarah gets to, you know, do her studies and and who knows, she meets someone who is actually right for her and actually wants the same thing she wants. Um and she can form a real relationship with with, with them and, and have an actual family, right? So a kid with a partner who's there available. But yeah, I think for us, like this, this piece of news, when it came, it made everything else we talked about so real. Because I guess it would have happened in December when she would have given birth. It would have been the same thing. Because you and I, we if about things all the time. We're like, what if the world was just a portal to another thing? You know, like, what if this or that? And we talk about these hypotheses, like all the time and our minds work in that way, right? We've got this huge imagination and we just kind of theorize about everything. And obviously empathically, also as a woman, also as someone who's gone through it, like I know, I feel, and I understand that there's there's this other life involved and you understand because that's why it is so hard for you to just be like, yeah, I wanna be involved in whatever way, right? It's not that because you, it's a big difference to you, right? What's happening. 
But that message to me was very much like an eye opener, right? It wasn't it wasn't one of our theories. It wasn't one of our ifs. It wasn't one of our hypotheses. This is this was as real as it gets and there's there's suffering involved, right? Like there's someone who on the other side of all these conversations is is going through probably one of the toughest things they'll be going through ever. Um so yeah, and he, it made it made me, I guess, um, ponder, right? And it like it made me pause and think about, you know, what we do and how we approach stuff. And obviously, it doesn't make me want to stop talking about things because I don't think things get talked about enough, right? Because I do still believe this is continues to be a taboo, socially, culturally, within our families, within our, you know. Uh, communities especially asian communities it's just it just is a taboo so maybe things would have been easier for her if other people had known and if other people could have supported her more right more of her friends but it gave me a bit of pause you know because because we talk about stuff all the time so so it was just kind of like shit this is so real and 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 i just felt like i wanted to be there for her so i just thought if this is how i feel like I was, you know, I definitely thought about how you felt and if you felt that kind of pull to be there. And and you said you you guys did talk, right? And you did try to console her. So the reason I wasn't more forthcoming with like trying to, you know, be a better friend and and be someone, you know, and, and like proactively approach her is is because like I think the damage is done, right? Like based on how I reacted and based on the conversations we had and what we said in therapy and stuff, I think you know, because what I wanted was to really get her side of the story from therapy and also I wanted to I guess get my side across. So we both hurt each other in our bluntest ways without mm-hmm. trying to hurt each other. But of course, there's always going to be like bullets that ricochet, right? Like, like, like yeah. that's just how it is, right? And I typically deliver things quite straight anyway. So I, I think the damage there was already done, and it's, and I didn't want to like give anybody false hope, right? To be like, oh, so caring and so nice, and after saying what I said, because I actually meant it, and that's how I felt. So. Um, I think the only the only thing or the only thing that I could have done was you know, you know be nice but be civil keep my distance and not get too close again. Just I don't know maybe it's like a mechanism that I'm protecting myself right, but I'm mm-hmm. also thinking about her as well. I, like you know I, I approached it maybe more strategically than I should. Mm. But but that's how I felt, right? Like I mean, like so when we first met, it was like everything was great. We were we were really cool. I really liked her. But then when this happened, like m- the opinions that I had of her, and probably the same for her, was completely changed, right? Like where we weren't on the same level of understanding. We had you know different motives. We had diff- you know mm. different ways of thinking things. So and then it just basically drew this huge line in the sand to say hey we're actually super different people and um so like it's like that how i met your mother episode where the glass just shatters and you can never look at that person again and that's basically what happened yeah it's interesting because i think so i mentioned that i was emailing with with sarah um because the way i hear you talk about this is you're saying um a, you were trying to keep a distance so that there's n- no more like kind of gray area of of what this is. But B, you thought that maybe you had already crossed uh, or like broken certain things. And then this person's not looking at you the same way and you're not looking the same at them. But in the email that she had sent me, one of the emails, um, she mentioned a couple of things and she and I was... I was actually quite positively taken aback and I was like, you know, 
it's easy to judge someone through the spectrum of what you hear about them in a specific situation. And it's very different to hear from them and then chat with them and actually see this other side of them. And to me, it seemed, you know, she was actually quite mature the way she was talking about you. And she was like, you know, I still really admire him. I'm trying to move on, but, you know, I wish him all the best. And I think he does amazing things. And, you know, so her opinion of you was still quite extremely high. I mean, I guess if this had happened to me, like, and the other, the person on the other end was you or a type of person like you, what the Gen Zs call a fuck boy, um, I... <laughs> Definitely would have been much more angry, potentially. Uh, or yeah, I mean, I guess I guess maybe this situation would have never happened just because, yeah, I, I guess this is not where I'm at in my life, right? Like, that's not what I'm seeking. But yeah, had this been six, seven years ago, eight years ago, maybe this would, this would be this type of person. And then I would have definitely reacted differently and I wouldn't have had such a good opinion, maybe. Um, but I thought she had such a high opinion of you and, and, and yeah, so I, so I was very surprised. Um, so I think you might be thinking less of yourself and projecting that onto what she might be thinking because you kept saying, you know, she was staying strong for you both and you're the one that freaked out and you're the one that did this and that so i feel like you might even be judging yourself more than she's judging you um which you know which then as always brings me to the questions of you know what's wrong with you chris (laughs) (laughs) so many things remember i tell you this all the time no um that's actually a really good analysis because i didn't actually think about it that way because in our conversation, she had also said, like, keep doing what you're doing and all this stuff. So she was like super nice and and very cordial. But that's the that's just the way I took it, right? Like that that's what I just yeah. thought, like that you're supposed to do when you say bye, mm. right? You just be nice and then let's get on with our yeah. lives. So that's very interesting that um, that was your conclusion of your analysis. But I think maybe I do in some sense felt I dealt with it wrong um, in hindsight. But I think if I did it, like if I if it went like played back the same way, would I have done it again the same? I might have, you know, like I, I don't know what I would have done better, how to deal a with the situation. No, let's say that's already, let's say the boat has already sailed on that, right? What happens yeah. if this happens again? Because it's probably going to happen again. No, it's not. You're wearing condoms. No, but yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, no, but it could and- happen again, right? Okay. So, so hypothetically, right? I'm dating a girl. We really like each other. So we're having unprotected sex. But and then there's, you know, she's pregnant, but I don't want a baby yet. See, it, like, there's many ways it could still happen. Right. See, but this pisses me off, though. Because, like, I love you to bits, but I'm also like, why are you so irresponsible? Because it's like, you know, that's fine if you like each other and you want to have unprotected sex uh, in terms of not wearing a condom. Un- unlayered sex or whatever. But why not use pills? There's a million other things you guys could be doing. I, I agree. You know, I agree. Yeah, like just then, pills. And if right, and if the, that person's not using pills, then take the responsibility on you and wear a condom. And don't like you can't just be playing around with people's uteri, if that's the plural for uterus. <laughs> Why not? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Just no. It's just bad. Yes. Yeah. But I think I don't know what I think to say. That's, yeah. Go. go. I, I do wonder though. I do wonder because I I keep I keep thinking about. Um, I think about a general approach to relationships, right? Like a general, how we view relationships uh, in our generation um, and what we want out of them and how well do we filter to get to those relationships. And I think if anybody meets you, they can't possibly think this is like going to be a serious thing, right? I know deep down inside, you do want a serious relationship. I know about that. But you are also still working on so many things within yourself that I don't think you're ready to be that vulnerable yet. 
I agree. Unless a saint comes along and... But even in that case, it's almost impossible because until you say, I'm ready, I'm ready and I'm doing the work and I, I'm going for it, then no matter who comes along, it's just not going to work. And and the situation repeats itself because you go one step forward, two steps back. And that's the stage you're in, right? When it comes to commitment. And I think had, and, and I'm not saying this is like outside of the situation with you and Sarah, right? I'm just using like a general hypothetical in us young people looking for relationships and stepping into relationships. I think when you compare like you and me in terms of like what we seek, like you're still very much in the stage of like, I'm loving the single life. I love dating around. I love my fingers in different pies and I can do whatever. And I'm like a serial monogamist, right? I'm like, I'm here to find someone I can build a life with. So I think when it, when it comes to that, I think there's a moment where the person on my end, right, seeking a, a male partner, and I'm obviously speaking from a, you know, hetero, uh, sexual stand, standpoint, because like that's my experience and that's what I understand, right? So girl seeking guy, and then there's the serial monogamist, like uh, my partner, who, well, he technically only had one very long relationship before this one, and you, right? This guy who's still kind of like, I'm still exploring, right? I'm still figuring stuff out for myself. Um, I think when you're in my seat, you can have a couple of different choices. And I think it takes a lot of failures. It takes a lot of self-awareness. It takes a lot of hard work and therapy. I'm not saying I'm anywhere yet. I just happen have happened to gone past some work in therapy, had a shit ton of bad experiences and come to a point of realization. I want serious relationship with a serious person who's emotionally available emotionally intelligent mature and ready to be vulnerable and the chris that i'm seeing that's not the relationship i want because i know what's there i've been there like i've been there so many times and i know what comes from that and i no longer seek that right so i think it's not about saying other people are bad other people don't know it's just that we are not equipped right? Nobody teaches us, nobody educates us. This is how you seek a relationship, or this is what you want to look for, or this, these are the feelings or like red flags or gut feelings that we should be paying attention to, to know whether to go left or right. Like, you know, there is no manual that's been given to us growing up as a teenager, going into, you know, the first sexual encounters to your first relationships, to then like having more serious relationships and then, you know, being in your thirties, like no one tells you this is how to do it, right? You just, it's really a lot of like trial and error. So when I look at this situation, I'm like, oh my God, like literally goosebumps. I never want to put myself in this situation, right? Um, but funnily enough, I was in a very similar situation, but it was still different, right? Because the partner I had was also reacting very different to it. So I think when there's like an in moment when there's an internal shift where you finally like have gathered enough data throughout your life and been lucky enough, which I consider it a privilege to have been able to go to therapy, to have been able to do all of that, you are able to like, okay, now it clicks, right? Like now I have a bit more awareness and now I know what I'm seeking. But that's on the side of the seeker, right? Of the girl, for me at least. And then on your side, I think there's a responsibility of just being honest, right? Which I know you think you have been, and I know on past episodes we talked about, you know, the dance and whether we, you know, express ourselves and our desires and needs, etc. Um, but yeah, it this subject is very much just kind of like it's tickling a lot of spots like in my mind about like dating and what we do when we date, when we like when we don't know ourselves, like when you don't know yourself, can you really go out there and find what you're really seeking, right? Like if you don't have that awareness without coming across like some kind of douchebag that's like, oh, I'm here to tell you guys like how to do this or that. Like that's not the point. It's just like, it's an interesting discussion for me. I, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, if you know what you want, all power to you, right? But um, there's definitely that journey of discovery. And I'm not there yet. You know, I'm not ready to kind of like, decide um at this moment in time uh or maybe it's the lack of decision that's really tripping me up but 
you know, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. Just um, a few more years, a few more years. I have no doubt whatsoever that you'll get there. And it's not even saying like mine's good and yours bad. It's just such a different set of circumstances. Uh, you know, things that were possible for you, things that you had gone through, things that you were exposed to, your childhood. Like, there's just so many things, right? And it's it's just fascinating, right, to look at the human mind, human feelings, humans, like, way of taking in what's around us, how we relate to others, and, and you know, seeing the math happen and the equation in this specific situation equaled baby right and and then there was a whole thing to solve that equation like because now the baby wasn't really wanted by both parties so what to do in this situation it's a it's a it's just an interesting thing and i guess we'll we'll do a love series so we can dive more into that there okay so on that note i think this is the end of a five episode series called big questions where i deal with an unwanted pregnancy and we basically talk through everything and this is the result and i think um yeah a lot more to come um where we deal with all sorts of crazy life shit but until next time and love i don't i don't know i don't know what we do i don't know what we do what you see? It sound right, boy.